we are nearing the end of our study in the book of Revelation. And all of God's people said, amen. Now, we saw in chapter 17 God's judgment on the false religion of the day. Remember, it's a one-world religion. They're all worshiping the same thing, but it's comprised of every false doctrine, occult practice, and new age philosophy that you can think of. And it's all kind of melded together as one big lump, and that's what everybody's worshiping. In chapter 17, God uses the Antichrist to judge that, that religion. Revelation 17.1 says, come with me. He said, and I will show you judgment that is going to come on the great prostitute that sits on many waters. And the prostitute, as we learn, is, the, is that one world religion. In chapter 18, God told us that he's going to judge the one world economic and commercial systems. The Antichrist has set up the mark of the beast so that everyone has to have that in order to buy or sell. And the merchants and the leaders of companies have made themselves rich off the backs of the regular people because they overcharge and they do everything they can to make more and more money. And they use all these immoral practices to gain wealth and to enrich themselves more than worrying about the people. And God, in a single day, kind of ends that. Revelation 18, 9. It says, And the rulers of the world who took part in her immoral acts and enjoyed her great luxury, will mourn for her as they see the smoke rising from her charred remains. They will stand at a distance, terrified by her great torment. They will cry out, how terrible, how terrible for Babylon, that great city. In one single moment, God's judgment came on her. How many kind of want that to happen right now? You know, you see that, and you realize what hell is going to be like. And even, even the, the folks that you think are just, you know, doing the worst stuff, you know, you, you don't want them to see you in hell forever, for eternity. You want them to get saved. And you want to have, God has compassion on them. But in, in these three chapters and the rest of the book, God pours his wrath out upon those who don't believe. And... Uh, we, I was talking to my wife, and I don't usually title my sermons much to Brad's must dismay. I just have Lesson 32 as my title. But I think this one's going to be, we win. <laughs> or we, we are winning, I guess would be a better phrase. Now we come to chapter 19. People have always wanted to know how and when everything's going to end. We were driving down in Gettysburg yesterday for Shirley's birthday party. And we saw this sign that said, uh, fortune telling and astrology and palm reading at this house, you know. Everybody wants to know what their future is going to be. They want to read their horoscope. They, they want to see what's going to happen. And they miss the point, the book that tells them what's going to happen. And so now chapters 19 and 20 show us five key elements are going to happen just before God wraps everything up. Now, I'm going to read a lot of Revelation 19 and then go back into it. Revelation 19, starting in verse 1, says, After this, I heard the sound of a vast crowd in heaven shouting, Hallelujah, salvation is from our God. Glory and power belong to him alone. His judgments are true and just. He has punished the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality, and he has avenged the murder of his servants. And again and again, their voices rang, Hallelujah. The smoke from that city ascends forever and ever. Then the 24 elders and the four living beings fell down and worshiped God, who was sitting on the throne. And they cried out, Amen, hallelujah. And from that throne came a voice that said, Praise our God, all his servants, from the least to the greatest, all who fear him. Then I heard again what sounded like a great, a shout of a huge crowd, or the roar of a mighty ocean waves, or the crash of a loud thunder. Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let me stop right there for a second. It's okay to be loud in worship. How many know that? It's okay to be boisterous and loud and raucous when you're worshiping God. I mean, in heaven, it sounds like an earthquake and, and mighty rushing waters in, as they're worshiping God. So it's okay in the spirit to be vocal in your worship. You know, we all watch football games and stuff, and we go crazy at football games. Well, now we're worshiping the God of the universe. And it's okay to be excited about that and worship him and just raise our voices to God. So let me continue. 
Verse seven says, let, let us be glad and rejoice and honor him. For the time has come for the wedding feast of the lamb and the bride has prepared herself. She is permitted to wear the finest linen. Fine linen represents the good deeds done by the people of God. And the angel said, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast of the lamb, he said. And he added, and these are the true words that come from God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said, don't worship me, for I am a servant of God, just like you and other brothers and sisters who testify of their faith in Jesus. Worship God. For the essence of prophecy is to give a clear witness for Jesus. Now, back in chapter 18, we read this in verse 20. It says, but you, O heaven, rejoice over her fate. But you also rejoice, O holy people of God, and apostles and prophets. For at last, God has judged her on your behalf. So they're rejoicing. 18 says, get ready, get ready to rejoice. Now 20 says, they are rejoicing. Why are they rejoicing? Well, the first one is, God has judged his enemies. You know, you see the world getting away with so much. It's like, when is it ever going to stop? There's coming a day that it's going to stop. Revelation 19.1 says, after this, I heard the sound of a vast crowd in heaven shouting, hallelujah. Salvation is from our God. Glory and power belong to him alone. His judgments are true and just. He has punished the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality, and he's avenged the murder of his servants. Again and again, their voices rang, hallelujah. The smoke from that city ascends forever and ever. Then the 24 elders and four living beings fell down and worshiped God, who was sitting on the throne, and they cried out, hallelujah, amen. It says, at, it says after this, Starts out with after this. We have three separate visions. We have a, a vision in chapter 17, a vision in chapter 18, and now a separate vision in chapter 19. And this time it wasn't an angel starting it out. It was the entire crowd in heaven shouting it out. Now, some feel it could be angels. Some feel it could be elders. But I believe it's everybody. Revelation 5.11 says, Then I looked again, and I heard the singing of thousands of millions of angels around the throne and the living beings and their elders. And they sang in a mighty chorus. So some feel it's angels singing that chorus. Some feel it's the, uh, the martyred saints. And some feel it's, in, well, Hebrews 12, 22. It says, now you have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to thousands of angels in joyful assembly. But Revelation 18 calls for everyone to join in. Verse 20 says, but you, O heaven, rejoice over her fate. And you also, a holy people of God, and apostles and prophets. So now you have all the angels. You have all of God's people, those who have been martyred and those who have just died naturally. Everyone who's in heaven is now wor worshiping and praising God because they saw the fall of their enemy. The people that caused them to be martyred, the people that persecuted them, God's finally now putting judgment upon them. The economic system and the religious system are now destroyed. And now everyone in heaven is praising God about this. Going back to verse one, it says, Af again, after this, I heard the sound of a vast crowd in heaven shouting, hallelujah. Now we sang hallelujah. We, you know, endless hallelujah is the last song we sang. Do we know what that word means? Well, the Greek word for praise is alleluia, no H. And that is the Greek form of the word hallelujah, hallelujah which is the Hebrew word for, as a command to praise. And the shortened word for Jehovah is Yah, J-A-H. So the word hallelujah, it literally means praise the Lord. So when you're saying hallelujah, you're saying praise the Lord. And they're praising the Lord, not for the fall of the Babylon system, but they're, following, they're praising God because God is true and righteous, and now he is glorified because of what has happened. You know, you see all the things happening in the world and you think, you know, the world thinks, where's God? All these things are happening. How come God's not intervening in this? Well, finally, God intervenes and God vindicates himself and everyone is praising God because now everyone sees that God is true and righteous and perfect. And he is glorified by these judgments. You have a, say, in a court trial, and you have a judge and a jury who render a, a perfect verdict. They have the evidence, they render the perfect verdict, and you know the person is guilty, and they go and they 
sentence is passed, what happens? The courtroom erupts in clapping. And society says, good, finally justice has been done. And if we know how to do that, can you imagine what it's going to be like in heaven when God exercises judgment on the people who have, who have killed other Christians and persecuted us and have, God has given a lot of time for them to repent and that, yet they haven't. And finally God says, okay, enough's enough. This is judgment. <clears throat> if you remember back in chapter 6, it says, verse 9, when the lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of all who had been martyred for the word of God and for being faithful in their witness. They called loudly to the Lord and said, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long will it be before you judge the people who belong to this world for what they have done to us? When will you avenge our blood against these people? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and they were told to rest a little longer until the full number of their brothers and sisters, their fellow servants of Jesus, have been martyred. So now we get to the point where all the full complement of Christians have been martyred. There's nothing left. And God finally is pouring out his judgment upon them. And they are now the same ones who are asking, how long is it going to be? They're the ones rejoicing and praising God because they're the ones that also know that God said in Romans 12, 19, I will take vengeance. I will repay those who deserve it, says the Lord. Now, a lot of times we, we want that to happen now, right? We want God's vengeance right now. But it doesn't always happen that way. But there's coming a time where there's going to be perfect judgment and perfect vengeance on those who have denied Christ and hated God. But think about that. How many of us, before we became Christians, <clears throat> hated God? And we might not have said that, but we lived our lives based on that fact. We didn't do anything that God wanted us to do. We thought we were being good, but everything that God asked us to do, we didn't do. So in effect, our lives were testimonies of our hatred of God. And yet God was long-suffering with us and saved us. And the Bible says that God is still long-suffering, not wanting any to perish. So while we're still here, while the church is still here, we're praying that God saves people. He saved us. And if he saved us, the Bible says nothing's too hard for God. He can save the hardest person. They're also rejoicing in heaven because God is reigning. Revelation 19.5 says, And from the throne came a voice that says, Praise our God, all his servants, from the least to the greatest, all who fear him. Then I heard again what sounded like the shot of a huge crowd or the roar of mighty ocean waves or the crash of loud thunder. Hallelujah for the Lord our God, the Lord Almighty reigns. In other words, everybody keep on praising God. Now we think that it only, it's only going to happen in Revelation, but how many know that God reigns right now? God is sovereign right now. Nothing happens that God doesn't know about, God doesn't approve, and God doesn't see. So God is always on the throne, and God is delaying his judgment in order that many people come to know Christ, but that judgment time is coming. Up to this point, God has always reigned. But there have always, there have always been rulers on earth that have reigned as well. Kings and priests and all the bad guys that have been here. But now all of that's come to an end. Nobody else on earth is, quote, reigning. God is the only one who's going to reign. And he's going to usher in the thousand years of peace or the millennial reign as we know it. He's getting ready to do that. And here the praise is louder than the first time. We're to praise God for his judgments, but we're also to praise God for fulfilling his promises. How many have had a promise fulfilled in your life by God? God's word says this, and it was fulfilled in your life. We've all got it. Whether it's salvation, whether it's healing, whatever it might be, provision. As I mentioned at the beginning, I was listening to Tony Evans, if you know who he is. He was saying that God is your source. That means everything you have, God is your source for. Everything else is a resource that God uses as a source. Your job, your intelligence, your ability, all those things that you have, God has given you as a way to provide for you. 
So everything we have is God's provision and basically a fulfillment of God's promise. So we should all the more praise God for fulfilling those promises. If you're here and you're breathing, you should praise God. I think your lesson was like that this morning. You should praise God where you are and for wherever you're going through because God says, I'm going to fulfill that promise. And we praise him even before we receive it. Now, all of those which up to this point include all of us who have trusted Christ, we're all in heaven and we're about to receive the fullness of our inheritance. How many have ever been the recipient of a will? Somebody's will. You ever go to a lawyer's office? When my, pa- my folks passed away, my brothers and I went to the, the lawyer and he read the will. And, you know, whatever we had, we had. Well, now you're in heaven and God says, okay, all up to this point, has been a promise of what's coming. Now the fulfillment of that blessing is going to happen right now. You were told on earth there's going to be eternity in paradise. Here it's where it's going to start. Verse 7 and 8 says, Let us be glad and rejoice and honor him. For the time has come for the wedding feast of the Lamb, and his bride has prepared herself. She is permitted to wear the, fi- the finest white linen. Fine linen represents the good deeds done by the people of God. Now, right now, we're looking forward to this, right? We're still here. We're still above ground. So we're waiting for this to happen. When we're there, we're going to be excited about that. We're going to be all more excited about it than we are now. Because right now, we're still living. We're still doing the things we have to do. We're going to work. We're feeding the kids. All those things we're still doing. And we're looking forward to heaven. But when you're there, they'll have no distraction. All you're going to be focused on is what is coming. Now think about the symbolism of this. We're the bride. Christ is the groom. As you plan a wedding, months or years in advance, you're excited when you start planning it. Well, at least the women are excited when you start planning it. Right? Guys, you're basically, you're one, you have one job. Show up. But the women are excited about the wedding, even though it's a year ahead. And they're excited, they're planning for it, But when the day finally gets here, then you're really excited, right? Right, Ty? Shake your head, yeah. And at the wedding, everybody's excited. Not everyone was excited a year ago, but now everyone's seated at the wedding. It's going to happen. Everyone's excited for what's going to happen. That's how it's going to be when we're in heaven. We're looking forward to it. It's in the future, and we're, we're excited about it. But man, when we're there... It's getting ready to happen. We're we're ready. Now, the fine linen here does not represent salvation or imputed righteousness. In other words, the white robe you're having is not because you're saved. The white robe symbolizes what? It even says, it says the fine linen represents the good deeds done by the people of God. These are the acts of faith and righteousness that we do now as a result of being saved. These acts don't save you, but they're what you do after you're saved and how you live after you're saved. How many know you're going to be judged on that? Everything we do now as Christians, God's going to judge. It's not going to keep you out of heaven. It's going to be whether or not you get rewards. And so 1 Corinthians uh, 1.3 says this. There's going to come a time of testing at the judgment day to see what kind of work each builder has done. Everyone's work will be put through the fire to see whether, it, whether or not it keeps its value. If the work survives the fire, that builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builders themselves will be saved, but like someone escaping through a wall of flames. So in other words, what we do here, we do for God's glory. We don't do it for our own self. We do what God's asking us to do. The Bible says, if you're doing it because you want someone to pat you on the back, the Bible says, that's your reward. Good job. And God forgets about it. But if you do it, let no one sees it, or no one knows you're doing it, and you do it because God's asking you to do it, that's when God says, okay, I'm marking that one down. And when it goes through the fire, that's going to survive. The stuff you do for the pat on the back and for recognition that stuff gets burned up. But God says, you do it because I'm asking you to do it. Whether or not people see it, 
Because you can be seen, but that's not your motivation for doing it. You're doing it because God has asked you to do it. And you're doing it for the glory of God. Then God says, okay, I'm marking that down. And the Bible says the fine linen is going to represent all the things you've done on this earth before you die. Verse 9 says, and the angel said, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words that come from God. Now up to this point, God, or John's only seen a vision. But the angel now says, start writing this down. So who's invited to the supper of the Lamb? Everybody? Well, 1 Thessalonians 4.16 tells us who is going to be invited. It says, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout and the call of the archangel and the trumpet call of God. First, all the Christians who have died will rise from their graves. Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and remain with him forever. So if you are born again, if you are saved, if you accepted Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, you're going to be at the, at the marriage supper of the Lamb. But the question you have to ask yourself is really, are you born again? Are you saved? If you're not saved, you're not invited. And if you're not invited, that means you're going to be included in the judgment that we've been talking about. So the most important choice, decision you're ever going to make, is do you know Christ? I was listening to a podcast the other day that uh, says that some of the churches have not talked about sin. They've kind of glossed over that. Hope we haven't done that here. The Bible says we're all sinners. How many agree with that statement? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. How many know without forgiveness of your sin, you're not going to be with Christ? The wage of the sin is death. Okay? But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ. Not because you're good, not because you're a good person, through Christ. John 1.12, as many as receive him, to those he gave the authority to become children of God. So you are a child of God not because you were born, but because you were born again. And that means you recognize that you're a sinner. That you have nothing in you that's worth anything to God. But as we said at the beginning, God loves you enough to reach down to save you from that sin, deliver you from that, and change you not leave you where you are. But if you've never come to a point in your life where you said, you know what, I recognize that. And I believe I'm a sinner and I need, God, I need God to save me. And as you're a Christian, you should remember back to a day when that happened. Now, if you were, you know, you were raised in church all your life and you got saved at kids camp or something, that you may not remember a specific day. But as an adult, you should remember that it happened. There should be a point in your life you say, you know what, I remember in August of 1986, I bowed my knee before Christ. You should know that day. If that day you don't have a day like that, you need to make that your day. You need to make today your that, that day. Revelation 19, verse 10 says, Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. This is the angel. But he said, No, don't worship me. For I'm a servant of God, just like you and your other brothers and sisters who testify of their faith with Jesus. Worship God. Now, the vision was so wonderful and amazing, it, it even tempted John to worship the messenger and not the author of the message. Now, how many of you like angels? Angels are messengers from God, meant to help us, but there's a lot of books and writings about angels. And there's some works, books about angel worship. But clearly God's word says we are not to worship angels. We are not to worship anything other than God. Angels are servants just like we are. Our job is to worship God alone. In fact, he makes it a point to emphasize it. Don't worship me, worship God. What happened the last time an angel wanted to receive worship? God kicked him out. That was Lucifer. 
God kicked him out and set him up for eternal destruction. And all that, the angel wanted him to worship himself. The Antichrist will want worship. That's why he got rid of the, the fake religion. And when people take the mark, they're not doing it for food alone. They're taking the mark because now at this point they're giving their allegiance to the Antichrist. The benefit is the food. But when they take the mark, they're doing it because they're now pledging allegiance to the, the false prophet, the, the Antichrist. And the way you qualify for the mark to buy food is to worship the beast. If you don't worship the beast, you're not getting the mark. The mark lets you buy food, but you have to worship the beast to get it. So the enemy wants worship for himself. And anything that you're tempted to worship, you know it comes from the hand of the enemy. Verse 10 says, for the essence of prophecy is to give a clear witness for Jesus. Now, how many times have we said that? When God does miracles, why does God do them? God does them so other people can hear about what God's doing and be drawn in and say, hey, what's God doing down there? I want to see. That's how revival starts. God starts doing miracles, healing people, answering prayer, and the world wants to see what God's doing. Every time Jesus did a miracle, it's because he had a chance to witness to someone. He got to share the gospel with them. He healed them, and then he preached. He healed that one, and then he preached. The miracles were a reason to get people to come to hear the message. And he says, the essence of prophecy is to what? To give a clear witness for Jesus. So every time there's a fulfilled prophecy in the Bible, and there's a lot of them, it should always point to Jesus. We've, we've been saying this throughout the series, that prophecy isn't meant to scare you, what? But to prepare you. Well, prepare you for what? Prepare you for the return of Christ by making sure that you're saved and making sure that you're ready for it. The Bible says, you know, we have to be ready for it. We have to live ready for it. You can't just live however you want and think you're going to get raptured because uh, I said a prayer 20 years ago. The Bible says we have to be ready for his return, and it could be at any moment. The other quote we gave you, prophecy isn't entertainment for the curious, it's encouragement for the serious. It should make everyone who hears it think about Jesus. You go through all the fulfilled prophecy, even just in the last century. Look at Israel. Israel was scattered. But God says, I'm going to make them a nation. They're going to have, a, they're going to have their own land at some point. And in 1948, what happened? Israel became a nation. Fulfilled Bible prophecy. Then Jerusalem became the capital of, Jeru of Israel 40 years after Israel became a nation. All of prophecy should make us see the glory and holiness of Jesus and encourage us to be ready. The chapter ends with the judgment of the political system. Now, we had the religious system go down. We had the economic and commercial system go down. And now we get to the very top of it. Revelation 19, 11 says, Then I saw heaven open and a white horse standing there. And the one sitting on the horse was named Faithful and True. For he judges fairly and then goes to war. His eyes were bright like flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns. A name was written on him, and only he knows what it meant. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his title was the Word of God. The armies of heaven dressed in pure white linen followed him on white horses. From his mouth came a sharp sword, and he struck down the nations. He ruled them with an iron rod, and he trod the winepress of the fierce wrath of Almighty God. And on his robe and thigh were written this title, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, this isn't the marriage supper. This is another vision that John sees heaven open up and Jesus coming to earth as a conqueror. He's not, he's not coming to take his people home. That happened in the rapture. He's coming back with his church to conquer and establish his kingdom on earth. And white linen here indicates those who've been made righteous. Now, the first white linen was the saints. This white linen is the imputed righteousness we have because we're Christians. He's coming with the word of God, which means everything he's going to do has already been written down and handed to us. So when this stuff happens, nobody should be surprised about it. The Bible's pretty plain about what's going to happen. 
And everything that's going to happen has already been written down. 1 Thessalonians 1 7 says, And God will provide rest for those who are being persecuted, and also for us when the Lord Jesus appears from heaven. He will come with his mighty angels in flaming fire, bringing judgment on those who don't know God and on those who refuse to obey the good news of our Lord Jesus. Now, the many crowns means he's king of kings, lord of lords. No other, no other person worthy of that title. And it also lists three different forms or pictures of judgment. He has a sword to cut down the nations. What's the Bible referred to as a sword of the spirit, right? The Bible is a sword, the only offensive weapon. So he's going to use the word of God to bring judgment. And he's going to use the rod of iron to shatter the nations. And it literally means the rod side of the shepherd's staff to destroy the enemies of the sheep. Now, if you saw the shepherd's hook, he uses the other side of that to beat away the, the wolves. That's what God's going to do with a rod of iron. And the wide press is reflecting back to Zechariah 13.5. If you've been in a wine press, it kind of just crushes the grapes. That's what's going to happen. Zechariah 14.3 says, Then the Lord will go out to fight against these nations as he has fought in times past. On that day, he will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will split apart, making a wide valley running from east to west. For half the mountain will move toward the north and half toward the south. You will flee through this valley, for it will reach across to Azai. Yes, you will flee as you did from the earthquake in the days of King Uzziah of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all his holy ones with us. That's this battle they're talking about, the battle of Armageddon. Verse 17 says, then I saw, back in Revelation 19, then I saw an angel standing in the sun, shouting to the vultures high in the sky, come gather together for the great banquet that God has provided. Come and eat the flesh of kings and captains and strong warriors, of horses and their riders, and of all humanity, both slave and free, small and great. Now, it, the timing in this is kind of flipping. They're going back and forth. The battle of Armageddon is soon going to be over. We are going to win. God's calling all the birds and the vultures, get ready, because there's going to be a lot of dead people, a lot of dead animals. They're calling them all together, and birds, vultures, unclean birds, get ready, it's going to happen. Right, the battle of Armageddon will soon be over. We win and the enemies or the vultures are going to clean up the dead bodies resulting from Christ's defeat of the nations. None of these bodies are going to receive a proper burial or a tombstone or recognition. They will be dead and the, and the um, birds will just eat them up. No matter how important or how much money or power you have at that moment, you will be all left in this field of shame and dishonor and you're going to be bird food. Going on in verse 19 in Revelation. Then I saw the beast gathering the kings of the earth and the armies in order to fight against the one sitting on the, arm, on the horse and his army. And the beast was captured and with him the false prophet who did mighty miracles on behalf of the beast. So they're getting ready for the battle. Both the beast and the false prophet were thrown alive into the lake that burns with uh, sulfur. The entire army was killed with a sharp sword that came out of the mouth of the one riding on the white horse. And all the vultures of the sky gorged themselves on the dead bodies. So he calls together all the birds. Get ready, it's going to be over in a second. God comes down and all the armies that are coming to fight against Israel, God eliminates in a minute. Just, they're all dead. There's no fight, there's no war. He kills them all in one second. The birds come down and eat the, the dead bodies. And God says he's throwing the beast and the false prophet at that moment into the lake of fire. Christ wins, now the enemy and his followers are getting ready for, their judge, for his judgment. The followers are all killed and they're awaiting their turn, turn at the great white throne judgment. How many know the difference? Judgment seat of Christ, great white throne judgment. Judgment seat of Christ is for us, Christians, when we get judged for the things we do. That's the white linen we talked about earlier. The great white throne judgment is for all of those followers who are not saved. Everyone gets to stand before God and tell their story. And God says, oh, you think you're, you're going to make it on your own merit? Okay, tell me your story, and I'll tell you whether you're making it or not. And so they, you know, they're going to think they get in on their works, 
and God's going to say, no, sorry, no. Revelation 14, 6, going back, it says, I saw another angel flying through the heavens, carrying the everlasting good news to preach the people who belong to this world, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. So up to this point, if you're alive at this moment before the war, you've heard the gospel. You will not have an excuse. I never heard it. Because the Bible says it went out to everybody, and everybody heard it in their own language, their own tribe, their own tongue. Everybody heard the gospel, and everybody rejected it. So at this point in the war, the only people that are there are those who have rejected the gospel. They've heard it and rejected it. And now God says, okay, judgment's coming. I gave you one last shot, and you rejected it. And the Bible says the Antichrist and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire. Satan's turn will come later than that. He gets thrown into the lake of fire after the millennium. And the wicked dead get thrown in at the great white throne judgment. Now the birds are now filled with the dead bodies and the beast and the false prophet are in hell and Satan's in prison. We're winning. It's not over yet, but we won that battle. Revelation 20, verse 1 and 3. Then I saw an angel come down from heaven in the, with the key to the bottomless pit and a heavy chain in his hand. He seized the dragon, that old serpent, devil, Satan, and bound him in chains for a thousand years. The angel threw him into the bottomless pit, which he then shut and locked so Satan could not deceive the nations anymore until the thousand years were finished. We win. Now we're entering into the thousand years of peace on the earth. These are for the believers that are still alive. A thousand years. The enemy, it's going to be peace. But there's going to be people that are born during that thousand years. And the Bible says that later on, the, God's going to release the devil for a little bit to tempt those who have never heard, never had been tempted before, to make them choose as well. Everyone has to make a choice. You hear the gospel, you have to make a choice. And during that thousand years, people are going to be born who've never been tempted, never had any interaction with the devil or demons or anything else, but they've also never heard the gospel. So the devil's going to tempt them at the end of the thousand years, and they're going to, he's going to tempt them to either believe in Christ or not believe in Christ. And they've got to make a choice. Everyone has to make a choice. But up to this point, nothing is going to hinder the establishment of the thousand-year reign. Then we get to the good part next week, where it's just about everything's winding down. And we have a new heavens and a new earth. All that's coming. And the Bible says that God's going to, most people believe that he's going to burn up the earth and start over rather than trying to fix what's here. I mean, you have an old car that's just, you try fixing, you try fixing, you just, you know, time to get rid of it. That's the way the world's going to be. It's going to be nice, but it's, you can't fix it. God's going to burn it up and start brand new with the new heavens and the new earth. And the Bible says, wherein dwelleth righteousness. That's going to be, more like the Garden of Eden, that's where we're going to spend eternity. And it's quicker than you think. And the older you get, the closer it's going to be. And you want to be ready for it. And the Bible says that nobody knows when Christ is coming back. It could be tomorrow. It could be 100 years from now. You don't know. But what you do know is that everyone is going to come to a point where we die. Whether it's today or 50 years from now. You want to be ready for that moment. Because this is where you want to spend eternity. And that means whatever we do now is in small comparison to what eternity is going to be like. You know, we do, I'd, I'd say this at funerals, you plan for everything. You plan to send your kids to college, you plan for a job, you plan for, to buy a house, you plan to buy a car, you plan for retirement. Do you plan for what happens after you die? Now, I'm not talking about funeral arrangements. I'm talking about when you leave this planet, have you planned for where you're going to go? If you haven't planned, don't think you have the guarantee of tomorrow to do that. You read every day in the newspaper, some young person dies for whatever reason. 
or a baby is killed or whatever the case might be. Someone's killed in a car wreck. I think it was a car wreck on 83. This week someone died. You don't know. But you need to plan like it could happen to you. How many of you have a will? Why? Because you're planning if something happens to you. And that's great. But you need to plan for where you're going to go when you die because we're all going to be there. I'm going to ask you to stand real quick. I know they're cooking the hot dogs out there and we're all hungry, but I never want to make the mistake that everyone who sits in a church knows Christ and has been forgiven. So if you bow your heads with, them for, with me for a moment. Most of you know I sat in the church for three years and I wasn't saved. Everyone thought I was saved because I was a nice guy. But really, I wasn't a nice guy. I was just nice to the people that I saw. So I don't believe that everybody who sits in a church who appears to be a nice guy is a Christian. I can't assume that. So that's why we have to ask every week, are you ready? If you were to die today, are you ready to meet God? I said earlier, the Bible says we're all sinners. We are every one of us a sinner. And that means if you're a sinner, God says the wages of those sins is death. And that death means separation from God. The Bible also says that the gift of God is eternal life through Christ. That means Christ paid the penalty for your sin. The things that you should suffer because of your sin, Jesus already did. And the difference is what you have to do is believe it. And not just in your head, but just to believe in your heart. The Bible says if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. Believing in your head is not enough. The devils believe in, in their head. But when you come to the point in your life where you say, you know what, I know I'm a sinner. I need Jesus to forgive me. And you pray and you ask Jesus to forgive you. That's the time that you know you're saved. And you recognize that and you mark it in your Bible as the day you got saved. And if you've not done that and you know you need to do it, when the Bible says today is a day of salvation, you may not be here next week. Today's a day. So if you want to ask Christ into your life to forgive you of your sins, I want to pray with you. Would you raise your hand right now? All right, I'm going to assume and believe that we're all committed followers of Christ. But now we have to prepare our hearts. Maybe you're not living the way you know you should be living. And maybe you're not really caring about the rewards, but there's going to come a time when you care about those rewards. When everyone else around you is getting their reward and you get nothing, you're going to care. And besides that, we want to live our life to show God how thankful we are for what he's done for us. So Father, we stand before you this morning and we, and we are thankful. We are thankful for all you've done for us. You've blessed us more than we deserve. Just by sending Jesus, you've done more than we deserve. I pray you would fill each one of us daily with the Spirit of God that our hearts and our minds will be constantly focused on you, that we'd be able to go to work full of the Holy Spirit, full of excitement, but living our life to honor you. And we can do that in our job, and we can do that in our house, and we can do that when we're shopping. We can live our life to honor you. Help us to do that. Help other people to see something in us that draws them to you. We read all prophecy is meant to get people's attention for Jesus. I believe that our lives are supposed to do the same thing. When people see us and see our attitude and see our demeanor and see how we live, they're going to want to know why. And help us to be ready, as your word says, to be prepared to give everyone an answer of the hope we have within and I pray that you would set up those divine appointments. Allow us to be used for the glory of God. And the Bible says we will receive a crown of righteousness on that day. 
So Father, bless us as we leave today. Again, fill us with your spirit. Use us for your glory, we ask in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. God bless you. Get your wallets ready. They got the hot dogs going.